Welcome back to ECE 320A. Today we're going to try to finish up the second unit, which is three-phase power. And to help put all of that information together, I've actually provided you with some additional material, which I'm calling 2.4S for supplement. There's notes and video for that, but it talks about these equations for load transformations. If you're trying to go from a Y to a delta or a delta to a Y, you can simply use the formulas, but here's some background information on how those arise, those formulas, and that's really when you have unbalanced impedances in either a delta or a Y interconnected structure. How do you relate those? Yes. And so if and so if you have balanced three phase systems, I actually in that material show where those equations come from, but essentially it's the way to remember in a balanced three phase, maybe if I could draw, here are the different Those are all supposed to be squares, but here would be maybe terminal A, terminal B, and terminal C. The Ys are inside the deltas, so the Ys are the smaller impedances in a balanced three phase. That's sort of how to intuitively think about, oh, there's a factor of three relationship, which one's which? Well, this little graphic why did I draw it wrong? I drew it wrong. I didn't want the Y's to be that way. I wanted them to actually go one here, one here, and one here. So that it looks a little bit better. There's one, there's another, and there's the third. So that should look like, oh, between points or terminals A and B and between terminals B and C and C and A, you could either have a Y configuration or a delta configuration. And which one you have, if you want to transform back and forth in a balanced set, they're related by a factor of three. And hopefully just this graphic says, oh, the Ys are actually a third as big as the deltas. That's sort of the bottom line of that supplementary lecture 2.4S. Homework two, which you are doing and mastering, is due on Tuesday, the 12th. I'm actually providing you with homework solutions. Obviously, they're graded when you submit your work in mastering, but if you wanted to see how I might have approached the problem or looked at the problem, that material will be available. Obviously, homework two solutions better not be posted yet on D2L, but if they are, good for you. If they're not bad, or if they are, bad on me, but I think those will be available after you turn yours in or submit yours on, it'll probably be available Wednesday morning, and you'll have a couple of days to look at those. There's a review session scheduled and that's next Tuesday in this classroom after our normal lecture. And I'll try to make that notes and video available as well for the review if you can't make it physically. I know that most of you will be there just because you... Uh, that was kind of a joke. But anyway, <laughs> all of my jokes are kind of jokes. Exam 1, you can't forget, that's a week from today. That's on the 14th of February, and review material for that is on D2L. Today what I want to do is go over the process for exam number one, and then finish up this unit by deriving expressions or equations that give you the total three-phase power in terms of magnitudes not using phasers, but now magnitudes. Somebody might give you the line magnitude voltage, they might give you the line current magnitude, and if they give you the power factor or the angle, you can now find the total three-phase power in this three-phase system. And we'll derive those formulas for one interconnected structure. And we'll see if 
any of this made sense by the quiz or the example. Let's get started. Exam 1 process. Here's what you can and can't do. You can bring one sheet of notes, 8.5 by 11, front and back, and that you can have on your little desk. That's about all the room you have, and that's allowed. You can also bring a calculator. I'm sort of restricting you to not having a supercomputer or some other computer in your possession, but you can have a TI-89 or an Inspire or the T HP, that's basic, there's a, basically su supercomputers versus a few years ago, but you can have those, something to write with if you need some drafting tools, if you want to be able to measure angles or draw or sketch, you can have a ruler, you can have a compass if you want that. But it may not be necessary, but that's what I'm meaning by draw, drafting tools. Don't bring or have available on your desktop your cell phone, a computer, a textbook, or class notes. That won't be allowed. Questions on exam number one. That's the process. Yes? Will, will there be balanced or unbalanced three-phase problems on this exam, I can't promise you that there won't because you actually may have to do some conversions back and forth, but you should be, well, what would that mean? Now you have to do just solve some mesh problems. Maybe it's setting it up. Maybe you don't have to solve everything, but you should be able to work your way through the setup of an unbalanced three-phase system. But the emphasis won't be on that. It should look similar to previous exams which you now have available to you on the exam number one unit in D2L. If you can work several of those exams comfortably, you should be in pretty good shape for the exam on Thursday. Other questions on exam number one. So the topics, I have a list of topics. I also have those practice exams. That should give you a pretty good feel for what to expect a week from today for exam number one. Let's finish up this unit, which is the total. We're going to try to, we will derive formulas for the total three-phase complex power of a load, let's say. You could do this also for a source, but maybe it's a little bit more intuitive to think about it at the load side. But let's look at one of the connections that you can have. You could also derive these for the delta, and it would be similarly derived. It won't be exactly the same, but I think you should be able to see how you would derive, and the formulas are exactly the same because the resulting formulas are just going to involve the line current and the line voltage and the angle of the impedance or the power factor. Now, in order to do that, if we are calculating the power, the complex power at the load, if I said give me an expression for the complex power in one of the phases in this Y configured load, what would be a formula that you would provide to me to give me the A phase complex power? Oh, you're looking for partial credit. So now I see somebody saying S equals. Right? So now you have a half a point out of 50 on partial credit. You've now written down S sub A bar equals. Yes. So now what are you wanting? Sub 
So now, what have I, what have I indicated? So I'm kind of setting you up to fail with the labeling on this diagram. What have I shown you here? Line voltage and line current. Can we use those to get the A phase complex power? You need the phase voltage, don't you, of one of those impedances. So in fact, you need something that I haven't yet labeled. You need the voltage across that a phase impedance, which is the phase voltage. If I'm asking for the A phase complex power, it needs to have the voltage across that phase and the current through that phase. In this case, in the Y configuration, I have to use the phase voltage, which in fact is V sub A sub N. Here's N. times the complex conjugate of the A phase current, which in this case is also the line current. But this is now the expression for complex power using of the A phase. And if you now had something like, let's say that we had V sub A N equaling V sub what do I want to say? Let's just say that it's balanced. So now there's the magnitude and we have an angle of theta sub v in the A phase. And I've already indicated what the notation will be, we will use for the line current. That's I sub phi at an angle of theta sub I sub A. Now you could write that as S sub A, the complex power is now whoops, equal to V sub phi at an angle of theta V sub A times I sub phi at an angle of theta sub I sub A conjugate. So that here we would have V sub phi, I sub phi, angle of, once we conjugate the theta sub I, it's now theta V sub A minus theta I sub A. Or this, actually I want, I don't want to start just yet with this power, so let me I know you're jealous that I'm being able to just cut and paste and not tape my paper, but I apologize. You can do this later. Now you've slid powers down, but I'm still focusing on this. And what I want to say here is what's the phase of the impedance? Is that sitting here anywhere? That's just this angle, isn't it? It's the difference between the voltage and the current. So this theta, the angle of our impedance, theta sub z sub phi, is just theta v sub a minus theta i sub a. If we had all of this information, if we had the magnitude of our phase voltage and we had the magnitude of our phase current, that's what V sub phi and I sub phi are. And if we knew the angle of our impedance, we could, or we could produce the complex power in one of the phases, which is the A phase. This is now just some number at a given angle. And that's a polar form of a complex number. If you put it in rectangular form, the real part will be the real power. The imaginary part will be the complex power. There's your equation. But now what we want to do is we actually want to write powers in terms of these other variables and just their magnitudes that maybe we can measure. 
what's happening behind the terminals A, B, C might be unavailable to us and we maybe can't go in and measure V sub A in, the phase voltage. So can we now derive an equation for the total complex power if somebody measures the voltage dropped across two terminals A and B and they can give us the magnitude of the current in the line. That's what we want to try to derive. We know though that if we had V sub A in, here's how we could find both the real part and the imaginary part or the real power and the reactive power. Question? Would would the voltage across or between terminals A and B be zero in a balanced three phase system? Anybody want to help? Is VAB going to be zero? It shouldn't be if V sub A N. I think what's confusing you maybe is, oh, didn't we just do KVL and set those three ver three voltages to zero. If we do KVL, uh, I hope you can see that this is V sub B in across there and this is, if you were to now, we derived last time the relationship between the line current, sorry, the line voltage, V sub AB, and these phase voltages. And we did that by writing a KVL equation. We said minus V sub AB plus V sub AN minus V sub BN is equal to zero. But that doesn't say that VAB is zero. VAB is, a, is made up of two phase voltages. They are phasers, but hopefully VAB, well, it depends <laughs> if you don't want to pay the bill. VAB being zero is a good thing. You wouldn't have any power. No, the, the question was, so the phase impedances, they are equal. And what we would do is we would have extracted a single phase equivalent and we could have calculated VAN. Then I think we derived last time, I hate to even try to find it, but last time we should have derived VAB in terms of VAN. And here's how we set it up. And there was the KVL equation. And then we should have shown that they are related by this square root of 3 factor at an angle of 30 degrees. If you now have V sub A in, V sub A B, the transmission line voltage, is actually a factor of the square root of 3 bigger than the phase voltage. And it differs in phase by 30 degrees. So if you have a non-zero phase voltage, V sub A in, in your Y connected load, you will have a line voltage, V sub A B. Does that help? Now where was I? We now want to find the total complex power in terms of the magnitude of the line voltage, so the magnitude of VAB, and the magnitude of the line current. We now have it in terms of the magnitude of the phase voltage and the magnitude of the line, or the phase voltage and the phase current. Do you see how, you really have to focus to not get it confused. All right, so let's see if we can find these powers. Let's start, we'll just do it component wise. What's the expression if I now said I want the real power Wow, that's a weird R. The real power per phase. And I'm going to call that P sub phi. What I'm really asking you for is 
convert that polar polar form of the complex power into rectangular form and just give me the real piece of that. That's all I'm saying. What's the real power per phase? I have it for the A phase and this is a balanced three phase system. So the A phase, the B phase, and the C phase will give you exactly the same real and imaginary components. What's P sub phi if I write it in terms of the real component of that polar form of the complex power. <laughs> yes, did everyone hear that? I did, <laughs> if you couldn't tell. So it's just what? V sub phi, I sub phi, cosine of the angle. That's the real power per phase. I'm pulling a lot this semester, right? I don't have any muscles to pull, so I shouldn't be pulling anything. So here's P sub phi. This is now equal to V sub phi, I sub phi, cosine of theta. Let me call it, can I just abbreviate it to theta sub phi? That's what this is now. Is that okay? Does everybody buy that based on the complex power expression? Okay, so if you buy that, I have some lake property in just the other county of Arizona. No. <laughs> what do we have available to us? We know that this phase current, we could also write as the line current. Yes, this is just a magnitude and we know that the line current is exactly the same as the phase current in this Y connected load. I can now replace that I sub phi with the magnitude of the line current. Can I relate the magnitude of the line voltage to the magnitude of the phase voltage? Yes, I just showed you that, didn't I? That was the answer to the earlier question. It's related what? By a factor of a square root of three? And which one is which? Which one's bigger? The line voltage or the phase voltage in this Y configured load? The line voltage is bigger, right? By a square root of three. So to get V sub phi, we would have to reduce or divide the line voltage by this factor, square root of three. Is that viable? So now what I want to do is replace V sub phi with a line voltage magnitude, and that will do it. I sub phi is just I sub L, and this is cosine of theta sub phi, but we also can think of that cosine of theta sub phi. That's really just the power factor of that load. Yes, I did I. Yeah, so um, that theta sub phi, are you going to have to subtract uh, 30 from the, the previous difference that you already had? So now the, the angle of the impedance, ugh, sorry. The angle of the impedance, do we have to change that in any way? So we, we are just worrying about, so look at what we have in this complex power formula. We have a magnitude of our phase voltage, that's V sub phi. We have a magnitude of our phase current, which is I sub phi, and we simply need the angle of our impedance. We haven't done anything with this conversion of phase voltage to line voltage yet. Correct? Yes, the, re the full relationship for a voltage, phasor voltage of our line voltage and the phasor form of our phase voltage in a Y configured load does involve a shift, a scaling of the magnitude and an angle change. But we didn't need to use the angle information in our phase voltage. We just had the 
magnitude of our phase voltage. That's the only thing we're changing. This stays the same, the cosine of theta sub phi, the cosine of our impedance, or the cosine of the difference between our phase of the voltage minus the phase of our current. And those were both phase variables. Another question. So, no, no, we're not, okay, so maybe, I think you guys are thinking too far ahead. You're trying to convert currents, phase currents and phase voltages to line voltages and line currents when they might be different. In this case, we don't need to go that far. All we are trying to relate are magnitude information. The phase is just the difference of the phase voltages phaser angle minus the phase currents phase. And that is just the phase of the impedance. Say that again. Uh, they depend on the ABC sequence and which one you're going. Here we're only dealing with the, so uh, the question was, which if you're listening to this, you didn't hear, so I'll try to repeat it, but I'm not sure that I am going to repeat it faithfully. What you're, I think what you're struggling with is the notion of converting, which is a valid conversion, but not in this case. We don't need to go that far. You're trying to convert phase current and line current in a delta load, line voltage and phase voltage in a Y load. We don't have that. We just have one load configuration that we're talking about now. And the only difference that we are trying to perform is relating the magnitude of our phase voltage to the magnitude of our line voltage. We're not messing with the phase. The phase is accommodated in the phase of the impedance. We'll t we can talk about that offline maybe, but I, th I hope that this, you buy that this formula is okay for one of the phases in your load. This is the real power that you would have in one of the phases of your load in terms of the magnitude of the line voltage the magnitude of the line current and the angle of the impedance. If that's for one phase, what's the total real power? If we want to consider all three phases, what's the total real power if this is the power, real power for one phase? It's just three times one phase because you have three phases. This is now the total power, P sub T, is now three times P sub phi. And now I simply say three divided by the square root of three gives me the square root of three this now becomes the square root of three V line I line cosine theta phi. If you now want to find the total real power in a three phase load that's balanced, all somebody has to provide for you is the power factor, which they can see, they can measure the difference or the impedance of the load, let's say, the line voltage and the line current magnitudes. What if we wanted to do that for the reactive case?
Where did I get the multiplication by the square root of 3? Now I'm taking 3 times p sub phi, and my p sub phi had a square root of 3 in the denominator. So I'm just rewriting 3 as the square root of 3 times the square root of 3 and canceling that with the one I'm dividing by. So there's where the square root of 3 comes from. The reactive component per phase is similar. It's just now you have to multiply by the sine of the angle of your impedance. This now is Q sub phi is V sub phi, the magnitude of your phase voltage, I sub phi, the magnitude of your phase current, sine of theta sub phi. And if we now rewrote that in terms of line voltage and line current, Again, we would just say, oh, V sub line over the square root of 3, I sub line sine of theta sub phi. Now, if we wanted the total reactive, For all three phases, we just multiply Q sub phi by 3. Q sub t is now 3 Q sub phi. And there's that 3 divided by the square root of 3 again. And we then end up with the square root of 3 V line I line sine of theta sub phi. And that's the total reactive piece. And if we wanted then the total complex power, <coughs> and total now is really just embedding for all three phases. That's what I mean when I say total complex power. You could abbreviate that and say, well, that's PT plus J Q sub T, where these real component and the reactive component are, are orthogonally related. That's the total complex power of the load. But that is now simply the square root of 3, V line, I line, and those are just magnitudes at an angle of theta sub phi where the angle of theta sub phi we could convert using Euler to put it into rectangular form. And then we have what we had before. We have S sub t, the complex power is the square root of 3, V line I line times the cosine of theta sub phi plus J sine theta sub phi. And if you distribute that square root of 3 V sub L I sub L through that complex or that rectangular form of the angle of theta sub phi, you have your P total plus J Q total. And what do you need? You need the angle of the impedance, which could be given to you as a power factor. You need the line voltage and you need the line current. And you wouldn't have to go internal to your loads and try to connect to that neutral terminal. You would just say, oh, I'm measuring the voltage across these two terminals, A and B, and I'm measuring the line current in one of the transmission lines. And I'm just using the magnitudes. These are the magnitudes. I haven't put a bar over those. Those are just the magnitude piece of those complex phasers, if we had them in complex phaser form. Yes. So now the question is if I if you were given the line voltage phaser and the line current phaser can you now subtract 
the phases of those two and get the phase of the impedance. Is that correct? It's not. No, you don't, we don't need to subtract 30. So, so now what you were suggesting with that question was, oh, if I gave you V sub A, B as a phaser and I sub A, A as a phaser, can you now, so what would you have to do? You would have to convert or you have to find the angle of the impedance. And the angle of the impedance is related to the phase voltage and the phase current. The phase current's the same as the line current, but now you could, we have the relationship to convert from a line voltage phaser to a phase voltage phaser. You could make that conversion. Now you have the correct voltage phase, which is the phase angle of your phase voltage. You subtract that, or you have that angle, and you subtract from that the angle of your phase current. Yes. So, you know, forget the 30, forget the 30. The 30 is going to be the angle that differs VAB's phaser with VAN's phaser. That's where the 30 comes in. But you would have to know the, you could do all of that or somebody might give you the following quiz. Let me give you a quiz and let's see if that helps everyone get on the same page. Here's the quiz that I want to, Suppose, let's say, if the line voltage, and I know that everybody loves word problems, so that's how I'm writing this. If the line voltage in a balanced three phase Y connected load. is 130 volts RMS at the load terminals. And the line current is 2 amps RMS. That's part of the information that you're given. You're given the line voltage in a balanced three-phase Y-connected load to be 130 volts. And you're also told that the line current is 2 amps. Find the power factor of the load if the total three-phase inductive load consumes 120 watts. Whew. Luckily I fit that all on one screen. So there's a lot of information there, and this is what you will have to start processing to be ready for exam number one. You should be able to start decoding this information. So you now have this, and you want to ask a question? No, this is a quiz. You're answering it. So. You want clarification. You may not get clarification on the exam, but you can answer or you can ask a question, ra hold, raise your hand during an exam and I'll try to come around and if it's pertinent to the rest of the class, I will try to announce it.
Does that make sense? So now the 120 watts, can we assume that there's no complex part? From this information, does it matter and can you assume? So based on one of your homework problems, you can't assume the reactive component is zero. And if it's asking for a power factor, when would you not have complex or reactive power? When, what would the power factor end up being if you have no reactive power? It would have to be 1. So if you do the numbers and end up with a power factor of 1, you go, there's no reactive power. But if you find a power factor other than 1, you know that there's a reactive component to your complex power. What I think you might get twisted on is forgetting this total. This is all three phases are giving you 120 watts. What's 120 watts? That's a light bulb. This is a tiny problem in terms of electrical, but it could still kill you. But anyway. <laughs> both on the exam and real in reality if, if you had that going through your heart. Okay, so we have 130 volts. That's the, what is that? Is that, do we, do we have it as a phaser? Do we have it as a magnitude? Did anybody give us an angle? Oh, there's no angle. So that's the magnitude of the line voltage, isn't it? We're told that the line voltage is 130 volts. So you now have a formula that contains V sub L. That's 130. You also are told what? You're told the line current. You're told I sub L is 2. No phase is given. And you're told P sub T. You have the formula to find the, co the power factor. I have it on the screen, right? The total real power is the square root of 3 VL IL cosine of theta sub phi. What do you know? You were given the left hand side. You were also given quite a bit of the right-hand side. The only thing you were not given was the power factor, which is the cosine of theta sub phi, which is what you're trying to solve for. This is a beginning algebra question. That's why I wrote it as a word problem, because that's usually how you're given algebra problems, as a word problem. Go figure. So if you were working this, this is almost a one-line solution on the exam. You would say, or you could write, that PT is 120 watts, which is the square root of 3 VL IL cosine of theta sub phi. And this is the power factor. And you're given everything else. You can now simply use your calculator to compute this. PF is now P total divided by the square root of 3 VL IL. And if you do this, point two six six. Is this all you need for the power factor? You need to tell me what, what's the what kind of a power load net do you have? Is it 
inductive? Is it capacitive? And you tell me that by saying it's either lagging or leading. How can you tell? How can you tell? How can you tell? It was given to you in the problem, right? Somebody says, oh, this was an inductive load. Ding, 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 ding. So you were now told that it was inductive. So now what's the power factor? What's the complete answer to the power factor? You give me this, and you just get partial credit. So if it's a 50-point pro problem, you might get two points. <laughs> you need the other half, and it's apparently worth 48% of that problem, or no, 96% of that problem. So it might be worth half, but you need to tell me it's lagging. So don't leave that last piece off is what I'm trying to convince you of. It's .266 lagging. That's the power factor. Questions on that? Yes. So now the question was, all of these magnitudes or values were given in RMS. If I now said, oh, it's 130 volts, zero to peak, it's two amps and that's a maximum value, do you drop back and punt? Or what do you do? So all of our formulas, most of them have been for assuming our magnitudes are RMS units. But if they are in maximum units, you could convert those. We're assuming everything's sinusoidal. You could say, I'm assuming these are sinusoidal voltages and currents. So the maximums are connected to the RMS in what way? Square root of 2. So you would have the maximum divided by the square root of 2 to give you the 2 amps if it was the current and you would have the voltage divided by the square root of 2 to give you 130 RMS. That would be kind of a small step in that process if I gave them to you. That's not really what I'm worried about. Okay. So most everything, when, when we did have them in maximums, then we had to f remember to carry around this factor of one half. So we just said, let's forget the one half and just do everything in terms of RMS. And that's when we said complex power is V phasor I phasor conjugate. Those are assuming those are RMS units on the V and the I. I'm s did that answer your question or comment? So we just basically said, let's throw away the one half or not worry about it by dealing with RMS units. Other questions on this?